Welcome to Meme Analysis for Hedgehogs. Today I'm going to show you how to write code signatures with Yara. And this is kind of important because strings only get you so far. So there are malware samples that simply have no strings you can detect. Um, so you got to use code patterns at some point if you want to be as flexible as possible with Yara. If you want the full walkthrough, just continue. If you just want a summary of all the tips of all the learnings that we have this time, jump to the last chapter where I give a list of all of these things. This sample here is a private loader sample and I'm gonna show you how to create a signature for it and to test for it. So we open this in Ghidra and the first things you will be at the entry point and we want to go to the main. So let's do that first. And we rename this to main. Now when I scroll through this, the first thing I notice is we have dynamic imports. We have dynamically resolved functions. So it would be interesting to see where these are set. So I press the middle mouse button to see a highlighting. And here we can see PC var one is set here. So double click on this. I want to figure out where the API resolving function is. Why? Because it's a good opportunity to write a signature on it. API, dynamic API resolving is something that clean files usually don't do. So this is one of the primary targets that I like to use for signatures. We see that this is set here by this data location and this is a global variable. So if we double click on this, we see here in the disassembly view, the cross references to it. And one of the cross references is a right cross reference. This is what we are looking for. To know where this is being set, we want to know where the global variable is being set. So we click here. And now where we appear is at this location. And this is has to be the API resolving function. So let's double click on this. Let's call this API resolve. Scroll through a little bit. And one of the things I do already notice here. So here. And also here. This is parsing the part of executable file for the exports. And that is because I know these offsets. I have seen them so often that I actually don't need to mark it up anymore. But to make this better visible for you, let's actually mark it up. So one of the things you can notice here is this is NZ. Second, this is the PE signature. So this is PE. And that means since our variable is being compared to this, it has to have the type of the image DOS header. So let's write this down as the type here. Image DOS header, and it's a pointer to it. Let's do that. And now we see, okay, this variable is being compared, the magic value compared to MZ. Makes sense. Since it passes the exports, this is, has to be a DLF here. So this is a DLL base. And this has to be the PE header. Let's call this PE header. And as the type, we are going to use image anti headers. 
because of the comparison to PE. And now we see, okay, yeah, it's comparing the signature to that makes sense. This right here is not the magic that it checks, but it's really just the DLL base, which it adds to ELF anew. So it has a virtual address instead of a relative virtual address. So it's like more an absolute virtual address. And now you also see here that it's accessing the data directory in the optional header. And the data directory with the entry zero is the export directory. So if you set equate, ah, it was image directory, that's the resource. For some reason, I cannot set equate here. I don't know why, but zero is the exports. So what we have here is the export size. And this is the ex export directory address. We can also retype this to image export directory. And same with this variable, since we just add the DLL base here. So this is the virtual address here, uh, and this, the relative virtual address, RVA, and this is the export VA. And it has the same type. That's already here. So, okay. And now it's um, doing the rest of that. So we don't need to look at this anyhow. So the goal was not to mark up the code of private loader, but to actually figure out how to write a signature on this. And I personally, I would use this here. So let's say starting from the MZ check up and until the export directory. Why? Because these offsets, I don't have to wildcard that much. So the signature will have longer sequences and it's something that clean files usually do not do. So there are clean files that parse PE stuff. However, in this specific constellation, it probably won't happen in a clean file. So let's do that. So I want to use this, right? So let's first copy this into a text file. This part, just so we keep it already. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the settings here in edit tool options, listing fields operand fields and now I'm going to turn off the markups for the operands because I'm going to see easier what I need to wildcard. Now the names for the registers are the original registers instead of the interpretation of Ghidra. And I find it incredibly helpful to decide what to keep, what to throw away. Now, this I particularly chose because we don't have so many wildcards to set. The most important ones are the addresses. So you want your signature to be robust against changes, small changes in the code. And also against recompilation. So if, let's say, someone adds another function into this code, most of the addresses may change. So in general, I would always wildcard addresses. And the addresses here at calls or jumps, they either have a size of one, two, or four bytes. In these cases, I would wildcard for all these jumps, the addresses. Let's do that here, actually. Also, let's get rid of this. Don't need this. So this will be 
our future signature, right? So we want to put this into a Yara rule. This is what I would do. Now this part is important. I would definitely always keep information about what you detected in the comments. So just like I did right here, just keep this information because otherwise whoever is looking at your signature or has to maintain it or wants to use it, they have to reverse engineer again what you're detecting. And this is very annoying. I wish everyone would write down what kind of code they are detecting here. So the jumps. Let's copy and paste these wildcards. So by the way, if you want to know, if you're not sure how the instruction is made up, um, Melcat has a nice instruction overview. So if you click on one of the instructions like this one, you can see, okay, here's the build up. So this is opcode mod RM displacement, for instance. So let's look at one of the jumps, for instance. So we see opcode target. So target is what we want to wildcard here. Or if we are checking this call, opcode target. The target is what you want to wildcard. There's something else you usually want to wildcard. So this is wildcarding the addresses is accounting for additional functions. But what about additional variables? So additional variables will have the effect that other variables may be placed on a different location on the stack. So this might be more visible here. I don't want to use this for a signature, this part. However, um, let's assume you wanted to, you want to do something with these instructions in your signature. Now, I do recommend to wildcard the displacements here. So the displacements from EBP or ESP because this will change. So if you add another variable, other variables may be placed on a different location on the stack. What you also don't want to use for your signatures is the epilogue and the prologue. They will also change. Just add another variable and you have another stack size. So these are things you may want to take into account. So if you were to use this, you can now see this is the displacement. So this is this is little endian, right? So this is what you want to white cut from these. Or if you check the same here. So it's interpreting this as negative numbers, which they are. And here you can now see click on this. This is the displacement, right? What's mod RM? Mod RM encodes which registers are being used and what the addressing mode is. So if, um, if this is like directly the value of the register or if it's memory address, for instance. And the opcode byte is the kind of instruction. Okay, let's take a look at our signature now. Also, let's maybe set some highlight. Yeah and check if we forget forgot anything. So these are also displacements, by the way. However, we don't want to get rid of these. These are not displacements that start from EBP or ESP, but displacements that are used as offsets. And these offset values are relevant for this kind of algorithm. So 3C is ELF and new, and param2 is the base address. So we want to keep things like these um, 
in our signature. It's also a good idea to always keep a hash of the sample that you used as a reference on case you want to rework the signature, let's say you know it's causing false positives, you want to prevent those false positives, you will need the sample again to make sure it's still detecting the sample. So that's why I recommend to at least provide this information in the metadata. Let's now save this and test it against our file. So usages, you provide the rules file first and then the file you want to scan. Now we see it's detecting private loader. And if you wanted to see where it detects it, provide minus s, then you also get the location, which is the file offset and the pattern that matches with, there is only one this time, but if you had several, you would know which patterns match. So this is working. And now let's test this in unpack me. On unpack me, we navigate to Yara. We uh, go to our rules, let's create a new rule and we copy and paste the rule here that we just created. And now let's see what we get with this. First, let's validate it. It passed. Now we need to save it. And uh, finally, we can use it for hunting. So we press hunt, launch it with the default options. Let's see what we get. And sadly, we only have one sample. So this is the sample we wrote our signature on. And if this is the case, it's a pretty good sign that your signature is too strict and you need to change it. Because if your signature is not better than a blacklist entry on the hash, then it's no good. So let's change our signature and adjust it to that. What I highly recommend though, when you write signatures is that you get several samples. And to do this for our signature, some samples that are somewhat similar, I'm gonna split the signature a little bit into different parts. Let's check our rule. And what I'm doing now is this. Also, we don't need these anymore. And the condition will be two of them. This can likely create some false positives, but now it doesn't matter. So I deliberately split them where the jumps are. Maybe we should split them here as well. Say code five. And in case code is being reordered, and this may help. And now I will tell it to match only if we have two or three of them. Let's say three of them. So we validate. We save it. And now we hunt.
And now this looks much better. So we have eight samples and actually 10 samples that we match now. Nine of those have been unpacked, one has been submitted directly. And when you look at the results, you can see now that a lot of these are tagged as private loader. Not all of them, but that's where we need to check whether we need to adjust our signature. So that depends a little bit on your goal. So is your goal to detect private loader? Then you should make sure that all of these results are actually private loader samples. If it's just to detect malware, however, and other malware might also use some sort of PE parsing, then you would have to rather test your signature against a large base of clean code. However, the name of my signature is private loader export parsing. And if I see a name of a malware family, I'm also assuming that it identifies this malware family. Otherwise, we would have to rename this to just export parsing. So what I recommend doing now is to download all of these samples and look at them and see whether we can fix our signature. And maybe only use the patterns where the match didn't work before. So we select all of them and we download all of them. Let's now see how we can use that to uh, improve our signature. So I have our signature here and also the one we use for testing. And now we can check which of the patterns actually match and which don't match. We use minus S, we get a detailed output on which patterns match. So this is our folder that I downloaded from Unpack Me. These are all of the matches. Three of them are a little bit different. They are all Go binaries. And one of them was marked as Group Teba. So this is likely not what we want to match unless we decide to create a signature to generally detect export parsing, then we could use that. But otherwise, maybe let's concentrate on these and look at these later. So what we can see now is, so this is our original sample here. Um, and of course, all of the patterns match. But for some of the others, what we see here is that pattern one and two are not matching. Same here and same here. So these are the ones we need to look at. For that, we should open one of these samples in Ghidra. I already imported them and analyzed them. So usually you will start here at the entry point. However, we don't have to search for the interesting stuff. We can simply go there using this offset here. So this is this file. We want this offset. You go to Ghidra, you press G and you enter file offset. That's how you go to a certain file offset. Make sure that you append 0x, otherwise it means that's a mall. So we go there, and this looks pretty much like what we wrote our signature on. So this is the very same function, right? This is the API resolving function here. If you look at the cross-references to this function, 
what we see here is exactly what looks like private loader. So we should definitely attack this. Now let's look at the differences the why our signature doesn't exactly match here. So code one and code two specifically are interesting in this case. So code one is this part with the MZ. So we are here. If you mark this, you can see where in the disassembly this is. Um, so we are like, we are at this point here. And you check now the differences we see the first part is correct. However, here we have a different register. So we have here zero two, there it's zero seven. Below that, this is correct again. So this is the difference and it's encoding a register. What we can do now is firstly, we can simply put a wildcard there. But you should be aware that this allows more than you may intend to match. In this case, I think this is fine to do. Um, but if you didn't want that, like if you want to be really precise, you can use a tool like CodeRex. And I will put a link to this tool in the video description below. Uh, what you do with this is you provide a hex pattern of the code that you want to match. So choose the one that we did before. So like this, right? Okay, we need to remove the spaces. So what you get back now is regex of all the possible encodings that this will have. And these regexes are also independent from the registers. So you should definitely not use it as is because if you do that, your patterns will be, be very bad for performance. So they will be very slow. Yaga always needs at least four consecutive bytes, and this is not gonna happen if you are trying to encode every possibility with every register. But in those specific cases where the registers do not match, you may consider doing this instead of using a wildcard. So here we have this part of the code so we could encode these values instead of putting a wildcard there. How would we do that? For instance, let's try this just by example. We need to use alternatives. So we replace this with alternatives in the selection. Replace all, yeah. And in uh, Jara, the alternatives are encoded like that. Oh, I'm actually already tired of doing this. So this is how you would do it um, to, to encode all of the, to get all of the possible register encodings here. Um, let's not do this. It's hard to read and it's not necessary in our case. So let's actually continue like this. It's not check once we change this register if there is an improvement with our detections. So what signature was it? Oh, we can just look at all of them. We see now that the first one is matching. So this is fine. Now we check the second one. The second one should be right here. It was uh, this part here with the PE comparison, right? 
and so this is here and we can see now we have differences here this is also the register different register that is being used in this case we have differences here and the rest should be fine as it is so let's test the new signature and now all of them match one two three four five one two three four five so it looks like we got all of the patterns right it's now uses and apply it to our original signature that we actually wanted to use. So this should be fine now. Let's remove the minus S. I just want to see if it matches now, and it does. If you want to see what doesn't match, you provide minus N. And there's one that doesn't match. That is this one. We still have to wait for the analysis, so... It's no, it's done already. Okay, let's check. For this file, all of the patterns are matching, but apparently not the consecutive patterns here. So let's see where the differences are. Of course, we could also use this, but actually, this would be more precise on the private loader parsing for the export. So let's take a look. Not this one, but this one. And it seems there are two locations for this to appear. It doesn't seem to matter which we use. So let's take this one. Well, that looks quite odd, doesn't? No. Let's go to this file offset. This is here. Let's first declare this that this isn't code. That is odd. So let's go there. And we disassemble from here. And now we have here our code. So this is very odd and we would have to investigate why that's the case. But it seems that for these jumps here, the jump targets are simply missing. So cut out. Um, this code as it is, it won't work because here the jump address is simply missing and afterwards follows this data here. That's also why it has troubles to decompile this. Um, that's interesting. Uh, so if we were just to say we want to detect No matter if they are there or not. Yeah. Let's try this. Let's see if it works now. And now it might be easier to see if we remove minus S. Now we see our original function is also matching. So, all right. Last part is we investigate the Go binaries. Uh, however, 
it's not really our goal to detect them. So let's look into them. Could not open file. Why is that? Uh, I, I renamed it. So, Gobens. So our export parsing 2 is now matching. But code 2 is not matching and code 4 is not matching. I think it's fine that we don't detect those because actually I wanted to make this a rule that detects private loaders export parsing and not any kind of loaders export parsing. So let's keep it here and this um, signature and we're going to test the signature now and unpack me. We are back at unpack me. So let's now check our rules and create a new version for this rule, new revision. We will be using this validate. Now we save the rule and now let's hunt and hope that I still have some hunt quota. We launch it and let's see what we get. We should not get those uh, good loader samples anymore. So this looks good from the summary. So what did we actually learn today? Firstly, when creating code patterns, you should prefer areas where you need less wildcards to have longer code sequences. You should try to have at least one sequence of four bytes length so that Yara can work efficiently. Wildcard addresses in the code, so calls, jump addresses, wildcard these. Test your signature. I have the feeling a lot of people don't do that, especially for these uh, publicly available signatures. Some of them have conditions that simply don't work. So they probably never tested their signature. If you only detect the reference sample, then your signature is way too strict and needs corrections. Please wildcard displacement values of local variables. If the code adds another variable or removes one, the variables will be placed on a different location on the stack, so you don't actually want to detect those. Add at least one hash of the reference sample to your metadata. Don't use epilog and prolog for your pattern. Also, don't use stack cookies for your pattern. Always add the disassembly as a comment to code signatures. Really, this if you don't do this, it will cause people have to reverse engineer your signature. Don't do that. This person will probably be you once you have to maintain your signature. To improve your signature and test it and get similar samples to your signature, just split the code pattern at the jumps into several pieces and then only detect a subset of those pieces. So you can say if you have five pieces, detect three of them. The name of your Yara rule should be accurate. So don't use the malware family if you actually detect a technique that is used by several families. In Yara, there are two switches that I find very helpful. The first one is minus S. We can see where in at which offsets which patterns actually match. Secondly, you use minus N to see which files are not detected by your signature. So if your goal is to detect all of uh, all files of a certain subset, then use minus N to figure out which are not detected. Last but not least, we use code regs, a very useful tool to see or get variant variants of instruction encodings. And 
that includes also all kinds of instructions with different registers that are possible. But this um, gets, there's a trade-off to that. So it's hard to read if you apply these regex strings to your Yara rule, and it may also make the rule inefficient when it comes to performance. So use this as a help, but consider if the performance trade-off is something you want to do here. So that's it. Please let me know if any of that, what I told you today, helped you and share your signatures. If you want to learn math analysis from the ground up, please check the link in the video description below. It contains a coupon link to my Udemy course for beginners.